Uh, this is a research project that I currently have underway with my colleagues, uh, Ralph Andres, Christian Gamm, and uh, Axel Tuma at the University of Augsburg in Germany. And it's a, it's a project which really uh, I've been involved with probably, if you think about it, for uh, many years. Uh, it dates back to my, my interest in, 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 in scheduling and the interest in uh, scheduling to meet due dates as something that's been of interest to me since I was working at Black & Decker uh, 30 years ago as materials manager. And I was responsible for inventory, but more importantly, I was responsible for getting things into the assembly lines on time. And believe me, getting things on time was something really important then. And I've come to discover it's really important uh, since then. Uh, it also uh, ended up in my PhD dissertation. That um, The title of my dissertation was Job Shop Scheduling to Meet Due Dates, a simulation study. So you can see that this is a whole field of study that I've been interested in for, uh, for many years. So what I'd like to do today, if I can, in the 20 minutes that I have here, is just to try to give you an idea of the kind of project that this is involved. This is a, a basic research project. Uh, in the area of scheduling to meet due dates, particularly to minimize uh, job tardiness. So, here's the problem. If I can do this. Okay. We have a set of jobs, n of them, some set n. They're comprised of uh, each job we know ahead of time, they're available, okay, to be processed on a single machine. We know for each job it's processing time and it's due date, which is what the customer wants. And the objective is to find a completion time for each of those jobs in a way that minimizes the total tardiness of all the jobs. Okay? And the tardiness is defined, the total tardiness is simply the sum of all the individual tardinesses, which is the maximum value of either zero or at the completion time minus the due date. So if the completion time is greater than the due date, you've got tardiness. If the completion time is less than the due date, you've got zero tardiness. Well, this is a pretty easy looking problem, isn't it? Pretty simple, simple, maybe even simple minded. Uh, but uh, the question is I have for you now is, well, why would we want to study this problem, okay? So uh, uh, to answer that, I did some, uh, some Googling on single machine uh, scheduling to meet, to meet due dates. I'm gonna have to stand around here so I can see the, 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 the word. And uh, first of all, I looked at the word tardiness to see what's the general definition of tardiness. And if you're, I'm happy to see my students are here. We're interested in definitions of things. So this is the way uh, the free dictionary defines tardiness. Not arriving, occurring, or acting, or done at the schedule expected or usual time. It's something that's happened that didn't happen on time, okay? Is it great practical importance? I did some Googling, and I found out that uh, 757,500 times the word tardiness appears in a Google hit. Now, to put that in perspective, I did this. I also looked at uh, Donald Trump. <laughs> now, he got 176 million hits. Uh, the Dayton Flyers got 345,000 hits. Uh, sex got uh, 1,560,000 hits. Okay. Uh, uh, Lady Gaga got 96 million hits, by the way. And I was curious as hell. Yeah, I wanted to, how many, I got 66,000 hits. So uh, Jack Hanna did that. Business Source Complete, which is the, the database for, uh, for scientific business, or scientific uh, 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 articles, there were 6,335 hits. I found that in my, my workings with industry, with companies, I found that it's virtually th this idea of single machine tardiness, or tardiness in general, is really the most important thing in when you get into manufacturing operations. And particularly now with the focus on G JIT and Lean, we're finding out that if you produce it on time, you've got the lowest inventories. In fact, I've written another, a different paper where if we assume that the suppliers have forbidden, or you're, it's, it's, it's forbidden to ship early to your customers. What am I, I lost the thing here. If it's, if it's, yeah, that expected tardiness and expected flow time or expected inventory are identical. So it's, if you minimize tardiness, you've minimized inventory, which is really nice. Okay. I see in single machine scheduling, there's increasing number of applications. And this is because what we're finding out, in fact, big factories, they're finding out that let's, let's, let's split the factory into small work cells and let's, let's manage those cells individually. And what you have at a work cell is basically a single machine. Okay, so that's another idea that I can, can declare. Is it difficult? Is the problem difficult? It's NP hard, which means that 
uh, it's equivalent to a class of very complicated or very simple to explain schedule or problems which have defied solution for centuries. And it's unlikely that anyone is going to find simple solutions to this problem or the traveling salesman problem or the knapsack problem. It's a subject of long-lasting research. Back from 1959, a fellow named McNaughton in Manhattan wrote the first, the first essay on this problem. Right now, there's 340 hits in EBSCO using on the single machine tardiness problem, if you will. Right now, in the last two years, there are 30, 36 hits in the scientific literature on this problem. You think it would have been solved by now, right? Uh, but it's not. So I want to say to you, I think it's of great practical importance. It's not easy, and therefore that's what makes it interesting for me in wanting to continue to study it. Okay. Uh, just to make sure, or just to sh illustrate to you how, how difficult this problem is. Let's assume we have a problem of n, n jobs. And so the number of jobs here is shown here on the, on the left column. The number of possible sequences is simply the factorial, n factorial, so 5 factorial is 120. And suppose we had a computer that could, by brute force, okay, enumerate these schedules and see which one is the most tardiest. Okay? Well, if that thing, if that computer could go one schedule per millisecond, here's how many seconds it would take to solve a problem of size 1, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. We get down to a 25 job problem and we're into, uh, I think, 49 billion, 49 billion or 491 billion millennia to solve it. If we had a billion computers in the, com in the world, all working in parallel, we could get this 25 job problem solved in as little as 492 years. So, what I'm trying to say to you, that there's room for improvement. So the question is, how can we go about, how can we go about solving this very complex problem uh, in a more, better way? So, the, the trick or the idea that I'm working on is the idea of using precedence relations. And precedence relations are, are like this. If I know that one job is going to always be uh, ahead of another job in an optimum solution, then I can forget about all those, all those schedules in which the other job is first. So we're going to use this notation, J squiggly K, means that job J precedes job K in an optimum sequence. So every time we discover that job J precedes K in an optimum sequence, we reduce the search space by a factor of approximately two. Okay, we cut away half of the schedules to look at. And here's the nice part. If the, pres the precedent relations are transitive, what that means if if I discover that A precedes J in an optimum sequence and that J precedes K in an optimum sequence, right, then I know that I precedes K. So their effect of their discovery accumulates. So once I discover one thing, I can discover another, and that automatically discovers more, and these precedence relations accumulate. Schedules that meet all precedence relations are called dominant. So I don't need to look at any schedule. I can, what I can do is I can look at a, a problem, I can try to find out all these possible precedences ahead of time, and then only look at schedules in which all these precedences are obeyed. And those are the ones I would start looking at to enumerate, okay? Okay. For example, uh, here's a 20, here's a four job problem, jobs A, B, C, and D. There's 24 four factorial possible schedules, right? Suppose I first discover that A precedes D. Then I can call out all of the schedules that which A precedes D. Yeah, A precedes, which A doesn't precede D, excuse me. And I'm left with these schedules, which is exactly half of them. Then I come to discover that A precedes B, and I call out some more, and so on. So with actually one, two, three, four discoveries of precedence, I've reduced this problem from looking at 24 possible schedules to only three, just to give you an example. Now. To go further with this, I have to introduce a little bit of notation. Let's assume that, uh, let's say that this set B, B is the set of jobs that I've already discovered that are known to precede some job I. The BI set is there, all the jobs I know are going to go in front of it in an optimum schedule. And the A set is the after set. That's all the jobs that I know that must or will follow that job in an optimum sequence. So if you look at a set of all the jobs here, and I've got two jobs, J and K, which I'm about to think about w which job should go first, J or K, or K or J, okay? Uh, but I also know, I also have information about their sets. I know these are the jobs that go before J for sure, 
and go before K for sure, and likewise after J and after K. I call this, these two jobs an open pair, and I want to try to discover whether or not which one should go first in optimally in an optimal schedule. And I'm going to use this, informa I use this information about those, those to find that out. Just a little bit more about the power of these. Suppose the, 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 the sum of these, the number of jobs in the B set plus the number of jobs in the A set equals n minus 1. Then I've reduced this, the complexity of this problem considerably. For example, if n equals 7, there are 5,040 schedules. If I find out that there are six times that jo this one job is preceded by this, preceded by that, preceded by this, that's seven dis or six discoveries, right? I know it, it's the, the last job in the schedule, and I reduce the number of, uh, number of possible schedules to look at to 720, because now it's n minus 1, or 6 factorial. Now, more generally even, more generally, suppose I discover that the cardinality, or the, the sum of these uh, uh, B set and A set, the total number is, uh, is again, 6, but equal, they're equally divided. I've got three discoveries for B and three discoveries in the A set. That means that this job is going to have three jobs before it and three jobs after it, and now it's partitioned into two separate little problems, three factorial plus three factorial, which is only 12 possible schedules. So the point is, seven discoveries reduce this problem complexity from 5,040 to 12. All right. Well, you're wondering, how do you go about this? What's the details here of this? How are we doing for the time? Okay, we're doing fine. Uh, to test if job J is to proceed job K in an optimum schedule, okay, that's what we're interested in doing, okay? What we're going to do is we're going to use the principle of uh, contradiction. We're going to prove something by contradiction. We're going to assume something happens, and then we're going to show it can't happen. That's pretty much the idea here. So we're going to begin with a dominant sequence, Okay, because we know we don't have to look at other schedule, other kinds of schedules. And we're going to begin with a, a schedule in which K actually precedes J. Okay? And now we're going to construct another schedule, S prime, in which J precedes K this time. Okay? And we're going to do it in a way that disturbs the other remaining jobs in the schedule without trying to disturb them. So the only difference is J and K. And we can do this Actually, when you think about it, we can do this two ways. We can swap the positions of J, of K and J, or we can take the schedule SS, and we can take job K and exert it, insert it immediately after job J. Okay? So there's two things we can change to get a different schedule. And if that new schedule, okay, has at least as good a tardiness or lower tardiness than the original one, what have we done? We've proven that the original one cannot be optimum, and therefore, J must precede K in an optimum solution. That's pretty much the idea. It's just pretty much straightforward. And uh, more formally, uh, we have to look at lower bounds. It's, if the lower bound of the, um, we talk about the improvement or the degradation in tardiness. So this maneuver, think about it this way. Remember I said J is, uh, J is, is, is later and now it's going earlier, right? So there's going to be a tardiness improvement for it. And the other job, it's going to go later, so there'll be a degradation. So think about this maneuver. There'll be a degradation of one and an improvement for the other. And if the, the lowest bound, the, the smallest possible improvement, is even greater than the, the highest possible degradation of this job K, plus the degradation of all the other jobs that are involved, then we know that J precedes K, okay, in an optimal solution. Here's a picture. Here's the first schedule, Schedule S. We know that job K, we're starting with K precedes J, right, somewhere, here they are. And we know that the start time of, of K, okay, uh, at, at W, it, it has to be at least as big as the processing time of all of the jobs in the BK set, right? And likewise, uh, job J, who's sitting out there, its completion time C, it can't be, it has to be, it has to be such that the jobs in the a, AJ set are all in here, okay? So it's bounded. So we have those two bounds on the, on the placement of W and C. Now we take this job K and we swap it. We put it here and job J goes from here to here, okay? Now look what happened. As long as job J's processing time is smaller than K's, which is a requirement here, that means that the jobs in the middle, what happened to them? They reduce their, we reduce their, uh, their completion time so they cannot get tardier. Now the jobs here, they can't get changed, they haven't even changed at all. 
And these jobs don't change at all. So the only two jobs that are involved in this exchange are J and K. And here are the functions, so to speak, as a function of their due dates. Uh, this is the improvement of J, and this is the degradation of K. Now think of it this way. This is kind of a, a function of two variables, if you will. Uh, and if the, if the due date, say, let's say, for example, if the due date of J is here, right here, then there's its improvement, right? And the due date of K is here, then its degradation is this. So what do we got? Bingo. We've got uh, 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 a situation where the J precedes K. Okay? You follow me? I hope. Well, we've got similar situation when we use the insert after tactic. Uh, and thereby we have job K moving beyond job J. Okay? And then the jobs in the middle are not getting worse. And these jobs are not not changing at all. So we have, again, degradation and improvement functions, if you will. Okay? So that's the basic idea. What I've said so far is known in the literature. I didn't discover that. I knew it was known. What we're doing now in our project is say, instead of looking at just two jobs, let's bring a third job into the picture and let's, let's flip those around and see what, what can come out of it. So now we have the situation where you have the open pair J and K, and we've got a third job, say, W. Now, I put W here in the picture, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in this area. It could be a residing in BJ or BK already, this W, or it could be in AJ or AK, right? Uh, it certainly wouldn't be in its own BW or AW set. It couldn't be there, of course, okay? So we have pretty much two cases. We have W doesn't exist in any of these, which is where I'm showing it, or W exists in, in any one of these four, these four sets. You with me? Okay, so now the, 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 what we do then, we took a maneuvers of three jobs. What we've done is we studied this in a sense, and we found out that there are obviously different cases, if you will. Uh, and here's the case, for example, we've got seven new theorems, if you will. And the seven new theorems are, for example, theorem th SW1 is when W precedes K, we knew it ahead of time, and then now we start, we're, we're all, by the way, we're always starting with a schedule in which K precedes J, right? And we're trying to show that that can't be optimum. So, are you with me? So, we'll always have that situation. So, now suppose W is a predecessor of K in the optimal schedule. We got, so now we swap W with J. Here's another, where W is preceding K in an optimal schedule. We insert W after J. You with me? Uh, here's another uh, theorem where we have got uh, W as a follower of J, or it follows K in an optimum schedule, and we swap K with W, and so on. Okay, so you can picture we've got, well, eight different possibilities. One of them we discovered is redundant with these, so there's really only seven new possibilities. Well, here's the swap theorem number one, and I won't drag you through all this, but it's, uh, here's the theorem, how we state it. Given jobs J, K, and W, such that W is a member of the BBK set, and the processing time of J is less than the processing time of W. If this due date of J, well, the battery, we got a low battery here. If the due date of J is sufficiently small, I'll say it that way, if it's smaller than this spaghetti looking stuff, but it's, this stuff is really easy to calculate. This is all, this is a single, uh, you can put this in an Excel spreadsheet if you want, okay? All these numbers are known, so it's just maxes and mins. Uh, then we know that J is less than or equal to K. And here's the proof, in a sense, the outline. Begin with the dominant sequence in which W and K, right, precede J. We swap W with J and observe if the upper bound of the tardiness degradation of W is uh, less than the lower bound of the tardiness improvement plus the tardiness improvement of K and J. And this is the illustration of the figure for that. Now we've got three jobs involved, okay? Here's... Uh, W, and here's J, and we're going to swap them. And here's, K, remember, W is a predecessor, has to be before J, a K in an optimum sequence, okay? So we swap them, we swap them, and we get these two functions, these degradation and improvement functions, but we get a third improvement function, by the way, because uh, job K now is involved. So we've got two jobs improving, if you will, and only one job degrading, so maybe there's a chance of getting more, uh, getting an opportunity to show that J precedes K. Well, that's the, that's the theorem. Okay. 
Some observations. We start with a, with a schedule where W, K, and J, and then we swap W and J to ascertain if J uh, precedes K. And if this new schedule uh, has a tardiness lower than the original schedule, then we know the first one can't be optimum. We only, only consider dominant schedules. And now, the, I don't know if you noticed, but this new schedule we got to, and it was J, J it's, remember J and W, we, we swapped W with K, J, and now here it was J, and J first and then K, W. Well, this is not a dominant schedule. Why? Because uh, W is now following K, and it was supposed to be pre preceding K in an optimum schedule. So look at all the possible dominant schedules in which W precedes K. There's only three of them. There's W precedes K if J is out here, W precedes K if J is in the middle, or W precedes uh, K if J is at the end. Now we just proved that this particular schedule can't be optimum, so the only ones that can be optimum are these two. You see them? Now what's the commonality of those two? J precedes K, so it doesn't matter. So this might be the optimum solution, this might be, but I know in an optimal solution I can therefore uh, conclude that J precedes K. This is the same kind of thing we do for seven of these theorems, okay? And uh, to continue, well, we did a lot of computational work, all right? There is a Professor Beasley in, uh, I think he's in somewhere in England, uh, in one of the universities in England, and he's got a set of problems out on the web uh, where he's got 40 job problems, 50 job problems, and 100 job problems that researchers for the last 25 years have been fetching and trying their algorithms out to find out if their algorithm is faster than the other one, et cetera. So we used that database of problems to test out whether or not our theorems, our seven new theorems, are providing additionally more information or faster results than what's already known today. Uh, and uh, our second uh, thing we did is we wanted to make sure we confirmed that none of these theorems are redundant. Maybe one theorem would, would always give the same answer as another, or maybe redundant with an existing theorem that was already proven in the literature. So, uh, our objective then was to report on the marginal improvement in the total precedences found uh, to schedule. So here's just an idea, real quick. The 40 job problems will have 780 possible precedences to discover. A 100 job problem will have as many as, will have exactly 4,950 precedences to discover, okay? So the question is, how did, that, how did our, our theorems work out? Well, we built a, well, I didn't do it, but my colleagues in Germany are, are computer whizzes, and they built a superstructure computer program to uh, do all this testing and take the data and fetch it and do analysis, et cetera. Uh, so we started with all these different data sets, okay? And we went through a solver, and we did these various analyses. We used, uh, uh, we had to, well, we used different combinations of tests of, of, of combinations of theorems. And we finally reported on the total number of times the theorem hits, the theorems, or how many additional hits, or how many additional times we discovered precedences, and how many times did we have solo hits? How many times did one particular theorem always predict, some, or predict something that none of the other theorems was able to predict? That was important as well. Well, here's a, here's a very brief uh, set of early results. We've proven also now that all seven of the theorems are, are proven correctly. We know that. They're correct. Uh, and we applied it to all these problems from Beasley. And uh, here's the, a summary, very quickly, a summary of the results. The existing theorems, the ones I told you, the two in the beginning, okay, uh, of all the total, they found 92% of the possible precedences for the 42 job problems. We improved that to 95% of the possible precedences to discover, and so on. 91 versus 95, 93 versus... But here's the more interesting thing. The number of problems of this... You got a 125 job problem, okay? The current theorems are able to solve those problems. 30, 39 of those problems were solved completely. That means you never had to search. You just uh, tested all theorems and you found out the problems were solved. Well, our, our theorems were able to improve that to 114 of these 125. So without even any kind of exhaustive, any kind of enumerative search, uh, we're solving a large number of the problems that are in, and so on. This is one of the things that we're, uh, I guess, more proud of than anything else. Okay. Uh, future research. The future research is going to be, will be, possibly, to extend these results to more complicated problems. For example, when the, when the, when the job's tardiness is weighted, so one customer is more important than another customer, okay? So it would have a weight, and we want to minimize the total weighted tardiness. Uh, we want to develop maybe similar theorems for uh, the case when the, when the objective is to minimize the number of tardy jobs. That's a different kind of objective. Uh, 
and also, finally, to consider maneuvers in which there's even more than three jobs to make life even more complicated for us as well. I think I've finished this in the right amount of time. I want to say thank you for your attention, and I hope uh, I gave you an idea of, of one kind of project that we do uh, in the area of scheduling. Thank you.